Good evening. Welcome to our show, The Sandy Revisited. I'm your host, Tommy G. And I'm Teresa Sahai, your co-host. Dr. Alan Benamoff. And uh, we'll be uh, speaking tonight to uh, uh, our guest, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Sumner, Anthony G., and Lisa D. Gennaro. Uh, they have various stories of things that went on during Sandy and it from uh, the past until the present day today. Uh, so without further ado, we'll go right to Stephen. Stephen, tell us your story from, uh, from when it started to now. Well, we were in the house when the uh, hurricane hit. And the alarm system went off, indicating we lost the, uh, the ground line to the telephone. I ran over to the uh, back door to check it out. The, the basement was totally flooded. The water was coming in through the back door. So I ran over to my wife and yelling, my wife, we got to get stuff and put it up in the attic because we have 85-pound uh, Samoy dog and we got seven cats. Right. Plus, I had my camera equipment that was in the front porch. They had lost that. Uh, we ran around, basically. I, after I got the dog up in the attic, sandwiched him between me and the ladder to get him up in the attic. Then the first thing I had to do is I, I ran over and turned off the circuit breaker box to turn off the electricity because we still had electricity going in the house. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing that, my wife was grabbing some uh, blankets and some dry clothes to bring up in the attic. Uh, after I got the dog up there, then I was tossing up the cats one at a time into an unf unfinished attic. It was harrowing. The your water came up so fast, in a matter of minutes, it was about four inches over my doorknob in my front door. Two-thirds of the house was underwater. Everything, almost everything I had was destroyed. You were wading through that freezing water? I was running through that water trying to get all the cats together and throwing them up one at a time into the attic. You got them all? I got them all, thank God. Then I ran uh, I, as fast as I could. I started to go up the ladder, and then the doorbell's ringing. We had one of those Radio Shack uh, wireless doorbells. Yeah. I opened up the front door, and thank God we had the security storm doors. And the water was actually ringing the doorbell. Wow. After that, I ran over as fast as I could, got the, uh, the thing and turned that off, and then went up in the attic. My wife got on the cell phone while I was running around trying to do all this stuff, and she was trying to call up somebody, a friend of ours in Brooklyn, in Bergen Beach. Tony LaMonica, and she was on the phone. She called him up, and as she was talking to him, she told him, the water's coming in. Tony, help. That was the last thing she, she got over the phone before the phone went out. He was going out of his mind for at least a couple of days until they finally opened up the Verrazano Bridge and got across. He was all set. He finally got over to my house, and he picked up one of the cinder blocks because he was banging on my door and yelling. He was all set to throw this in the block through the window just to find out if I was alive or not. It was bad. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna flavorize it. It was really bad. Did you have any like candles or anything in the front? We had uh, some long burning incense candles, and I had one oil lamp, carrot. You know, one of these Character, oil lamps yeah. that they use. Uh, we. Uh, I had some stuff up in the attic for camping, mm -hmm. and we utilized that stuff plus some coats I throw. I threw around up in the attic, and I had a case of water up there. I managed to get the uh, food and water for the uh, the animals up there. Plus, I even got cat litter up there. Mm -hmm. Figured out uh, after we got up there, I forgot all about food for our own selves, my wife and myself. But I was so happy just to be able to get save all my cats and my dog. Well, how much time did you spend up there before you were able to come down? Oh, that was a good uh, 12 to 14 hours at least before the water receded enough for us to go down and venture forth and, and onto the, uh, because we have a ranch style house, it's all one level. Yeah. I got down there and I managed to pr push stuff away from the front door because everything was a shambles. I pushed things away, I opened up the front door and the vision I saw when I came out that front door, my next door neighbors, uh, one of them was completely ripped off this foundation and gutted the house. There was nothing, everything was all over the place. His uh, kitchen floor was in my backyard. Uh, the house next to him was turned into matchsticks. Nothing bigger than a matchstick. Everything was destroyed. Two houses across from them, 
same thing. Half the house was torn down and just sitting there blocking the street, and the other half the house was ripped off its foundation, leaning up, up against that house. Mm -hmm. It was virtually, I'd never seen it so bad in my life. That's something else. So uh, what happened the next day when you got out of there? Did you try to get any rescue people in? Or? Well, the, my friend came, and uh, because I had a car and a van, it was underwater. Yeah. Nothing was any good. Uh, my wife, all she had was a pair of shorts and, the, and, and slippers and the top, and that was it. When my friend came over, and he was, he was banging on the door, I was in the attic. I came running over there and, and got down the stairs and opened up the front door. He, was all, he had the cinder block in his hand. He was ready to break the glass to get into the house. Yeah. And he was just so happy. I'm surprised they let him down there because I, you know, I tried to get down there. I was able to get down uh, on Armstrong Avenue in, in my vicinity over in Eltingville, but uh, down, you know, that disaster area over there, they they weren't letting anybody in. How do you get in there? Well, uh, since I was a transit authority worker, mm -hmm. I just retired. He was still working for the MTA. He's still a active so he bus operator. Yeah. So he had his his ID and showed his ID and told them that he's, he's got a, a relative down there. And they let them through. Okay. All right. Now, what what happened? Like, uh, you know, days later, when you, you know, you try to figure out what you're going to do, and uh, contacting uh, various insurance companies, or finding out what they want you to do in the neighborhood. They want you to vacate. I mean, were they telling you to vacate the area? Well, uh, when my friend came over, that was a couple days later. That was a. Uh, I guess uh, that was more like the Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, what he did is when he came over, he said, you're not staying here. He says, you take whatever you got. He says, if you don't have anything, don't worry about it. I got stuff over my house. We'll make do. But you can't stay in this house because the, the smell of raw sewage, diesel fuel, all the nasty stuff that was in that water, yeah. it was overwhelming. I managed to get uh, my animals. Uh, the dog we took with us, the cats, I found a place where uh, I could board them for a few days mm -hmm. because uh, my friend's highly allergic to the to cat hair yeah. and dog hair. So he allowed me to keep the dog in his garage. But the cats, he, he couldn't tolerate it. Yeah. But we stayed in his house for, uh, that was a whole month from the time he brought us over there. Mm -hmm. And then while we were over there, that's how we registered for, for FEMA, FEMA on his computer. Yeah. Did you uh, have uh, flood insurance being done at no. all? Did they require it when you, bef when you, before all of this happened? No, no flood insurance. The bank told us when we first bought the place, we're not on a flood plane. We don't need flood insurance. And they actually advised not to get flood insurance. Okay. And uh, when we spoke, I spoke to other people. They said, oh, you don't need it. You never get hit with any, any high tide or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Only a quarter of my basement is stand up. And uh, the following year, that was uh, 2011, yeah. I lost my hot water, uh, hot water tank. Okay. In which case, I lost two hot water tanks in August due to heavy rains and whatnot. Yeah. I ended up having to take and get a hot, tankless hot water heater yeah. and have it installed in the laundry room out of the basement. Did and you have your electrical box moved up to the second floor? No, the electrical box was uh, was always up there. It was way up. It was uh, about uh, two-thirds up on the wall. Mm -hmm. So it was high enough above the water so there was no problem with that. Okay. Now, as far as uh, the insurance companies, I mean, uh, were they quick to act on your behalf no. or were they dragging their feet? I know it took me... Uh, two months to get a measly $4,000 to repair a roof, to get a new roof. Well, so. the insurance company was very slow in moving to the point where uh, they told us, well, what we'll do, uh, when they finally got to us, that was uh, end of December, beginning of January, and they said, well, we can get you some money, mm -hmm. uh, we'll get you for water backup, because I told them it came up through the basement. Yeah. And it flooded the house that way. Yeah, the insurance companies are not buying that. They, they, they wouldn't buy it with us either, and it did come up through the, the drains. But, but it did come up through the drains. It came right up through the dirt floor. Yeah, because hydrostatic pressure. It yeah. Pushes it up. It, 
it right. came up and it, it it overwhelmed us in minutes though okay. in minutes not not in hours okay it wasn't like the waves coming in and and mm -hmm. slowly coming up this happened in minutes it was overwhelming okay uh, I want to go to Tony uh, Anthony uh, and our next guest is Anthony G uh, I'd like to uh, hear your story I know you're a renter down there right. and you live across the street from uh, Steve. from Steve uh, just tell me what happened there Pretty much the same situation. I was in the house during the storm. I was there with my son. Um, he has a, a slight disability. He has what they call Asperger's syndrome. Mm -hmm. I have a physical disability. Um, the water just kept coming in. Just kept coming in. I wasn't asked or told to evacuate. Did not know. I had just moved in nine months before the storm. And I just figured it was just going to be a lot of wind couple of garbage pail covers in the street, maybe a garbage bag, you know, whatever. It wasn't like that. What really brought me to the front door was I heard my alarm go off in my car. The four-way flashes went off and the alarm went off, and I'm like, who could be stealing my car in this? When I, mean, I finally got a spot in front of my house, not like Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, where I came from, where you parked wherever. Mm -hmm. I finally had a spot in front of my house and my car's getting stolen. I go out and look, and I just watched my, pit, my driver's door glass go into the door and my trunk lid open up. I'm like, what's going on? My first instinct was run out, get the window up, and shut the door. Like, that was really going to protect me from that water. Yeah. Oh, right. You know? So what I did was I actually saw the car submerge, and then it bobbed up like a buoy. Okay. So I went out in a pair of, in a, in a pair of shorts because I was in the house. I was spasming all day because of the inclement weather, and I usually know it like a dog before it's really going to happen. And um, I just uh, went to reach for the, the car, and it just like floated away, away and it dragged me with it. Mind you, the, the water was up to it my breastbone now. It was cold, but like I said, instinct kicked in because I $14,000 car, I didn't want to see it get destroyed. Mm -hmm. So I watched it just, I just released it. After I got the trunk closed, I couldn't get to the window because there was no power coming from the key. And I watched it float into Steve's fence. Did they ever find the car afterwards? The car wound up, after I released it, it banked off Steve's fence like a pinball in a machine, and it wound up four days later up against a tree a block and a half away with about six cars wrapped around it. Did you guys try to t uh, check on each other during this whole thing? I didn't even know him. <laughs> oh, I okay. lived across the street no. from him, but uh, all we basically did was maybe, hello, hello, yeah. not even, yeah. just a smirk and a nod, yeah. you know, because I'm kind of trying to show I try not to, you know, give too much confidence, gain too much confidence, because I just try to keep to myself. So what happened with you being a renter? I mean, did FEMA, I, and I heard FEMA was uh, offering uh, $3,500 to renters. I got 28, 28 something, I think it was 28, 38, 28, 40, it was under 3,000. And they expected you to replace your and stuff with that? that was supposed to be two months rent. Meanwhile, they didn't allow for a broker's fee, mm -hmm. because was I going to pick up a newspaper and start looking at the classifieds? I needed to go to a real estate. So I went to a real estate. I paid a broker's fee. I paid a first month's rent. I paid a uh, month's security. And I wound up in an illegal studio. But I had absolutely no choice. You know, beggars can't be choosy. It was either that or a park bench. I didn't know that people were going to the local hotels weeks, weeks before. These are beach people. They must know what hurricanes are like, or what flooding is all about, or tropical storms, whatever they call it. Yeah. So a lot of the better hotels were all booked weeks in advance. So you had no insurance option. What about the landlord who owns the house? Did he have an insurance option? Unfortunately, my landlord owned, owns or owned 17 properties in the area. He lost 15 of 17. I guess he's considered, he's considered bankrupt now because the only two properties that were salvageable was mine because I was in it. And after I just let go of the car and went back in the house because my, my son got spooked, okay, we're bucketing the water out with a regular old-fashioned mop bucket. We're bucketing the water out, and it's gushing in. I'm throwing it out of the, uh, the kitchen window, you know, above the yeah. sink. And then we was just like, you know, I call him Dad because he's my son. And I was like, uh, just can't. Let's get up on the grandma's dining room table. So you're on a one-level house? One level. So you had to sit there and deal with the water? I had no choice. No attic in the house? No attic. And if there was an attic, how was I going to get to it? There was no ladder. All right, so that was in a completely different well, room. Deep, I had never been in the attic. You in the water all that time? I, the water had gotten up to, I had gotten maybe 
four and a half, five feet in the house. The crawl space must have took the rest. Yeah. Because Steve, he was he was like the Titanic across you the street. Said his was, was a little higher than his. My house is a little higher. Yeah, yeah. My house is, I think, three foot above his. Yeah. You know, three three of those cinder block. Yeah. And um, all night, I had change in my pocket. And all night, I was throwing coin. And I kept hearing clunk, clunk, clunk. Then, come the morning, after the two of us dozed off on a dining room table, I heard, tsk. I said, oh, it finally hit the ground. Yeah. And by that time, daylight, and it was just Did a murky mess. Did you see it? So you, f you smelled the oil and all? Ah, God, it was terrible. Okay. It was terrible. So what we did was we gathered whatever was gatherable, mm -hmm. and I just locked the doors because I figured there was going to be looting, which wound up coming to pass. Yeah. And not that I had anything valuable, I just didn't want anybody in there. So there was no discussion with the insurance company or anything? I had no insurance. I didn't have home or I didn't have uh, renter's insurance. And uh, it was about 30 hours later when I finally got through to FEMA. They took me over the phone through my cell. They did a verbal intake, and they said, just let's go through red tape now. Let's wait. you got to be patient. Okay. So what did you do after that? Did you still live in Gown in that area? No, no, no. I, I moved to the next town, you the Dungan Hills Grand, area. Uh, the Dungan Hill Grand that's, where, that's where the basement studio was available. And like I says, I, I just jumped on it, you know. Okay. A lot more money than I was paying. It took me three years to find this place, well, and I was only there nine months. The apartments dried up real quick right after that because <laughs> and not only that, I, I knew people who were gouging and selling cars, cars that only worth like fifteen hundred dollars. They wanted seven thousand for them. Yeah, and people were paying that money for yeah. junk because they were desperate to get a car. Absolutely. You know, uh, Doctor Benoff. Uh, yes. They. Uh, with their particular block is like a facetic grove, and it's very, in proximity to the water, I would say uh, less than a thousand feet, okay? Uh, what I noticed the last time we were down there, when we were working, taking a, a film crew down there, it was an angry, cold day, and the water, it, it's like there's no beach left, and the water was approaching the weeds in the back of the church. You know, it looked pretty close to me, and that would worry me to death if I lived down there. I mean, uh, what do we need down there? Do we need the Army Corps engineers to extend the beach out maybe another thousand feet? Dunes, artificial reefs, diking systems, what do we need out there? Well, there are many projects that can be done from hard stabilization to soft stabilization and so forth. I mean, um, let's take a seawall as an example. Um, most of the time seawalls are put in, you're gonna lose the beach. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about that because of the erosion that takes place. There's soft stabilization projects that they've done in New Jersey, artificial dunes, geotextile types of uh, fabrics, mm -hmm. um, vegetation planted, and so forth. The problem is that in these areas, they're very vulnerable to storm surge. Yeah. Now, of course, we haven't been hit for a long time. Uh, go back in historical records, I think the 1938 hurricane was pretty bad for the South Shore of Staten Island. Mm -hmm. 1944, I don't really, in 1960, we had Hurricane Donna. Donna, Donna, yeah. I mean, um, let's just say that, uh, I have to paraphrase our governor. There are some parcels of land that Mother Nature owns, and when she comes to visit, she visits. Mm -hmm. And he has a buyout program that he came to the College of Staten Island to talk about on February 25th. Mm -hmm. In the morning, I remember hearing him, and I had to say to myself, the first time I heard a politician ever say anything like that, the reality is that these areas are very vulnerable. If you go back at historical records, I don't have the maps here, but I can t talk about them. I've seen them. I've done research with them. You showed the population once. I and saw those uh, the population. We had a lot of hundreds. wetlands areas and areas that never really should have been built on. I mean, uh, the coastal areas, we have to understand how the coastline works and the coastal processes. And, and if you understand that, you'll understand why these areas are very vulnerable to uh, storm, yeah. storm surges and so forth. But I was not, see, New York, to, I've, I've noticed that we are very susceptible to nor'easters. We get them frequently in the yes. winter. Yes, but remember, if you look, see, we have a geometry of the coastline here different than others, different than the Netherlands or any other place like that. We have a right angle in the coastline. I don't have in front of me. 
If you look at a map of this area, you look at Corny Island and Sandy Hook, you have a right angle between them. Mm -hmm. Staten Island is right in that, that apex. So the seafloor comes up very gradually. Storm surges, let's say a hurricane, any hurricane that comes perpendicular to the coast of New Jersey is going to put us in harm's way. Now, we haven't had that in a while, but we saw that yeah. with Sandy. A high-pressure system in the north blocking any hurricane going to the northeast. Hurricane has no, no other recourse. choice but to go into New Jersey. It Once it does, uncanny that it made like a right turn, a left turn right yeah. into us. Well, that's your worst nightmare because the the I've northeast, never seen that. I, you know. uh, the northeast quadrant of a hurricane is the worst part because you have the forward speed of the hurricane and the wind speeds adding up. Yeah. And uh, I, when I saw that right turn projected, I then I knew we were in a lot of trouble. In a lot of trouble. So you think that all these uh, possible uh, ideas of uh, extending the sandbar out or, or putting artificial reefs or jetties out to try well, to break up the force of the All of these are like band-aids, band basically. Yeah. Uh, you got to face the you got to face the music here. The, the difficulty is that I noticed that uh, Chris Christie in Jersey is doing an amazing job of getting that shorefront rebuilt. He has it seems to. to be going very quickly. But yeah. down here, it seems like we're in the Stone Age. You know, they're doing work down South Beach, and I understand that's a beach in our resort area, but these poor people, they need some protection. They yeah. gotta put some sand dunes, they gotta push that beach back. They gotta get the Army Corps of engineer here to dredge that damn thing and push it back. Well, there's a lot of projects that can be done. You could have a beach nourishment program where they dredge offshore and they have these four foot pipes that they pipe all the sand uh, into an area where the longshore current will carry it across and build up the beach. Mm. And you could do that. But the, these are very expensive types of projects to do. What do you think, Teresa? What do you think about any of this? Well, basically, my, been down there, so. my husband and I have been working down in Sandy for about, I'd say, four months. We're also Sandy victims. We had five feet of water. We owned two homes. And we were helping Sandy victims in our basement. We got five feet of water. We didn't even know until we got home. That's how we met um, Stephen and Anthony G. Mm -hmm. And I could basically say it's a nightmare. There's no kitchens. Their house isn't even, some of them even start building. Yeah. The mold treatment is awful down there. They actually sure. gave them a sponge, I'm not kidding, a sponge bleach and um, some wipes and a mask. Mm -hmm. And they said that's going to help their mold treatment. Sure will. Yeah. And as for Anthony, he's having mold problems issues right now in his apartment. And Stevie's having some issues also in certain areas of the house. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a nightmare. You have to live it. It's like a pit it's of hell. It's a big health risk having mold. Extremely. Uh, mold has long term uh, things yeah. that happen to you because of it. Black mold particularly is the easiest when it grows. Uh, I've seen some mold come out on walls this far. It's well, like frothy white and it's terrible. Well, I'll tell you something, Tommy. There's two types. There's the one that's white, and then there's the one that's black. The black starts is very dangerous. If that gets into your body system, yeah. you could die instantly, especially within it gets into the lungs. Right. And they said to the everybody, just take a sponge, take some rags, take a mask, and sp spurt some bleach on it. It'll be clean. Yeah. No such thing. And within three days, four days, you could see the mold just coming through. Comes right back. Through the sheetrock, through the wood. Well, all, you, all you need is water, wetness, and, and 24 hours in darkness. Exactly. And that's all you need. You start exactly. And it's what people see the mold superficially on, on the walls, and they spray it. And most people go for bleach. You know what I mean? Uh, I've used bleach myself from time to time, but there are better products out there today. Uh, we'll discuss that later on when mm -hmm. we have uh, Lisa you know, and uh, Steve. Uh, they're going to talk about the mold. Um, Dr. Bell, uh, knowing this whole health issue thing with, with the mold, I mean, are the insurance companies that insure the houses somewhere down the line going to be liable for these people getting sick from the mold or not paying for mold removal? Well, I can't really... Um comment on that I don't uh, but uh, it's, it's, this is an issue that's going to have to be looked at who's re going to be responsible for it uh, the mold issue is a very uh, important health issue as we know and mm -hmm. I'm not sure who's going to be involved with it and, and what the, uh, 
In some cases, we have to rip the sheet rock off and then expose the, the uh, two by fours or whatever you have, two by sixes, I don't know. So when you expose the two by fours or two by sixes, the house is not at a construction, it's a basic bungalow, would be two by sixes or two by fours. Yeah, two by fours. Fours. Right. Yeah, Most well, likely, just the roof rafters would be two by sixes. Yeah. Right. It's very weak construction. But the but point is that they'll have to be dealt with somehow. Yeah. Somehow, there's gonna have to be some kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, exposed to the sunlight, uh, probably remediated somewhat. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, the sheet rock probably has to be removed. Right. When you were down there, uh, I know you were down there the following day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when it you was saw terrible. this, I mean, what would you compare it to? I can't, I've never seen anything like it. I was out at the crack of dawn on the 30th, which was a Tuesday. I, drew, I left at about 6 a.m. because I wanted to mark with a s maximum surge. I wouldn't even call it a surge, I call it still water. Uh, it's been referred to that. Where, where, did, where did the maximum water go up to? So I was out there, and I went down Sand Lane to start off with, and I, um, I saw a debris field that I had never seen before, and it was way up there at 256 Sand Lane. Wow. That's pretty that's far that's up. That's pretty far up towards the fire department. I, I stopped there. Um, I, I recorded it in my notebook and so forth. I, uh, I took pictures and I noted the house number, 256. I brought that back into my GIS type of system at the college and I started to plot the known contour lines there. It was between 12 and 14 feet above sea, point, level. above sea level. That's so that's the, m I would call it still water. Now there's some kind of ambiguity here. There's storm surge, there's storm tide, still water. And so I'm really interested, wh where did the water go up to? Now we have a normal mean uh, low water level that's referenced. And um, uh, so I marked this at 12 to 14 feet above sea level, whatever it happens to be. But now 15 we foot surge, that's not gonna be good. Well, the surge wasn't that, well you have to take into account that this was an unusual circumstance. Full you moon. have the full moon uh, so you have an astronomical high tide, the, the, uh, the, uh, the lunar high tide and so forth. Now, a couple of weeks ago I was uh, talking to a fellow, he's working for FEMA now, I don't have his name handy, but he used to work for New York City OEM, the Office of Emergency Management, and he was, they were always working on this. It's like a triple type of syndrome where you would get the maximum storm surge and the, the astronomical and the lunar tide. He also uh, told me that Sandy came in two hours before it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. Could have been a lot worse. And that it started to speed up and could it came been, in two hours before the maximum worse? high tide, yes. It came okay. in two hours before the maximum high tide. Oh, wow. really got it. So it could have been a lot worse. It was worse to begin with. So anyway, my recollection of this, after I took the data, I started to go along Father Capadano, and I couldn't believe what I saw. Um, now, Father Capadano is high, and then you have like a bowl over there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go west of Father Capadano, you have those low-lying streets yeah, by Slater, I Iona, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. I could not believe how many cars were submerged. I, I was, it was just unbelievable. I saw cars and walls. I saw yeah, through houses. Yeah. I saw yeah. through houses. I saw garage doors mm -hmm. where the garage door was pushed through and it went through the whole house, yeah, uh, yeah, through yeah. through the whole bo seen, bottom. I that, yeah. And I, I and I've taken a lot of pictures on this because we really want to study the effects of Sandy mm -hmm. so we can plan for the future. Mm 